Welcome everybody who's here at the CppCon physically and to the people on the internet land. Um, today we're going to talk about um, a project that's been ongoing for about a couple of years and it's about parallelism safety critical uh, guidelines for C++. Okay, I want to introduce my co-presenters, my co-authors, who's been working as a small team with me. We've been meeting online almost every week or every month. Um, I have Andreas Weiss from, um, uh, he's a staff engineer at Woven Planet, which actually is a division of Toyota, if I understand that correctly. Um, I am, and then there's Ilya Burloff. He's a principal engineer and is a, an architect for C++, Mizra, and, um, and contributes into Sickle. I'm a DE at Codeplay. I have a lot of hats, um, both inside the standard committee and outside the standard committee. Um, I might Research lately has been mostly being involved with high performance computing, but also at the other end, safety critical and everything in between from memory models to acceleration and parallelism. Um, we also have um, Christoph Mirwall who helped contribute to this, but he's not gonna be presenting. He is a, a senior software engineer at EDG, one of the people who builds the core of the C++ front end compilers. And he works a lot in this core working group. Okay, so what are, gonna, what are we gonna talk about? Um, this is something that's dear to our hearts and it's a passion of ours because we see that there's no, there's no rule, there's very rarely any rules that talks about safe parallelism in the world. There are lots of rules that talks about safe, safe sequential execution code, okay? So we're gonna talk about what we're planning to do in terms of adding safety to parallelism for both Misera and C++ core guideline. We're gonna do a deep dive into some of the C++ core guidelines we plan to um, um, inject or modify into the standard, into the core guideline. Um, some of this has been reviewed by, by Biana as well too. And we're gonna take a look closely at what future C++ parallelism are gonna bring and which part might need safety. You guys, if you were in the other room uh, half an hour ago and you heard me show you that table, I'm gonna go through that table and show you where we think the safety things are. Okay, and then we're gonna take a look at one subject that always gets asked, which is what is the difference <laughs> between core guideline and Misra? Okay, sounds good. All right, so first slide, very quick slide to show why we need it. If you're here, you probably already are convinced that we need something. Sure, there's gonna be lots of things like uh, APIs, self-driving cars, medical devices, drones, nuclear reactors that needs this, um, the safety guidelines, and the safety guideline is not gonna be just on sequential code. They know that in order to get things like autonomous vehicle working, it has to be parallel and probably has to be accelerated as well too. Well, what do you do about safety? There aren't any. Well, that's what our small group is aiming to do, okay? And this isn't just from us. You can see a long list of people starting with the United Nations legislating various requirements on these safety things, okay? So I've done this before where I look pretty much at where all the standards have been and our, our group's conclusion is that the two that we need to follow closely is MISRA and C++ core guideline for the simple reason that they are both constantly uh, being updated, whereas the other ones are kind of dormant. There's actually a third kind of reason. Um, both of these have more intentions of supporting safe parallelism rules, okay? All right. So this project started like four years ago, and since then we've had contributors from um, across the, you know, we've had parallelism experts and safety experts come in. It's actually quite difficult, believe it or not, to find people who are both parallelism experts and safety experts. You can lots, find lots on both sides, but never the twain shall cross, it seems, it seems, but they do. They're like, they're basically about five or six of us who's kind of capable, who are kind of into thinking it, you know, thinking of, making things fast, but also safe. But we do have contributions across the board, you know, from uh, NVIDIA, from Intel, from, uh, you know, my company Codeplay, from Toyota, uh, um, various companies that are uh, doing um, Misra that are, that are involved. Originally, this started under the umbrella of Misra, but we decided that it was good to be able to do it for both core guideline and Misra. So when we started, there was based in 2019, um, with the simple question, why are there no rules for parallelism in Misra? Well, the answer was, well, nobody, nobody kind of had the skills to work on it. And we said, well, we do. <laughs> or at least we think we do. <laughs> you guys be the judge of that. Um, after, by 2021, phase one was complete. Last year's talk revealed some of these um, phase one rules. 
these are where they come from. Um, they come from everywhere. There's high integrity C++, Rephrase, Cert, JSF, um, a whole bunch of things. And um, there's a link there for the phase one and out, which is, which is public. And then this is a spreadsheet that we started categorizing which rule we should accept, how easy they are to, um, to analyze. And you know, some of the harder rules we decided to put off to the next revision. Whereas the simpler rules we could easily accept right away because they were non-controversial. It's just, it's just good you know, um, project management, right? Try not to tackle everything all at once. Um, the big thing we discovered um, was that, and I talk, we talked about this in our talk last year, is that just like any analysis tool, you kind of have to separate things that can be analyzed by looking at it as a human and things that can be automatically uh, checked by, by tools. They both have benefits, okay? Um, and in some cases, uh, it can work for both humans and automated tool. And in some cases, neither will be good. Generally, human review, reviewable rules are, are pretty simple rules. You know, they have basic syntax that matches the intention of the syntax. Automat automated rules can do deeper things like, you know, you don't, you know they don't, they don't uh, mistake an L for one, things like that, because human eyes can fool yourself in those things. Um, but they tend to be limited to static scope, like whatever is in your compilation unit. If you have to go to dynamic scope or whole program analysis, that requires another beast that is not yet really there yet. Not to say it can't be, but it is a bit of a problem, okay? Um, okay, so that's, that's pretty, pretty, pretty much it. So we have separated out so that, you know, we saw that, you know, in a matrix, if it's easy for human to decide um, and tool to decide, C++ core guideline is pretty good for that, those things, okay? Um, but the, on the opposite side, which is if it's, that's the third road. If it's hard for human to decide, but easy for tool to decide, tools are the best thing. And in the core guideline, you probably put that as what's we call the meta rule, right? Okay. Um, and then the worst, the worst part is if they're both hard for human and machine to decide. Okay. But it turns out that once we did this, we kind of realized that probably most rules are good for both core guideline and MISRA. So as much as we can, our intention is to drive these rules into both as much as we can. Okay, so out of these, just a little analysis, we found out, so in MISRA, they categorize things as mandatory, required, advisory, and directive. Mandatory means there's no escape clause. You can't get out of it. Ad required means that you can give an explanation as to why you're gonna deviate from the rule, and maybe your, 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 your supervisor will accept it, okay? Um, but those, those, those escape clauses are few and far in between. Advisory is even looser, like you put, put a lot of things can allow you to escape it, okay? So out of these, we found that we had about eight mandatory rules by MISRA standards, 12 for required, 12 for advisory, five for directive, and then various distribution as to whether the rules were decided by humans versus um, automated tooling, okay? So out of these, we originally had thought about driving 12 of these to the core guideline plus tools, um, five for tools plus core guidelines, um, the first word is the primary um, um, entry, but at the end of the day, once we did it this year, we actually found about 24 rules that were ready for MISRA and core guideline. Um, so we specifically looked at core guideline and analyzed that, okay, so remember Bianca's keynote at the at last uh, Monday, right? And the last sentence on the last slide he said was more core guidelines, but, and then there was a bullet that says more concurrency. He and I have obviously been talking about this, and that was actually a nod to us because he's been working with our group for this as well too. Now, the, the concurrency part of the core guideline, okay, so as you know, there's like 90 to 100 rules to the core guideline. Mo almost all of them have to do with sequential programming. But there were some, there were about 36 rules that has to do with parallelism in four sections. They were mostly contributed by Bianca and Herb and no one else. Um, we, our aim as our, our group is to contribute new or modifications to those, um, to those guidelines based on our experience on an ongoing basis. Um, and I've already mentioned how sparse that intersection of parallelism and safety is. So this, is, this comes from the core guideline. The middle box tells you where it all starts. So in the core guideline, you're gonna see um, categories, concurrency, coroutines, parallelism, message passing, vectorization, lock-free programming, and at C concurrency rules. And you'll see that um, the concurrency rule has the most number in the core guidelines. Um, Lock-free programming has the second most. Coroutine has two or three. Parallelism has a lot of question marks, okay, and some suggestions. 
Message passing has two. Vectorization has a lot of, have, has only question marks. And SC concurrency is, you know, a few more things. So in total, it, it turns out that, you know, counting CP1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, 8, and 9, it turns out to be about 36. Okay, pretty thin in some ways, but not too bad. So our aim is to try to improve it. And when we went through our list, which is a totally a kind of a separate list, um, we found most of the rules falls into the following category. They had to do usually with deadlock violations and lifetime violations. And with that, these are gonna be, so in this spreadsheet, we, all, we organized it based on the status, the thing that's in the middle green that says, you know, accepted for initial, initial revision. And we classified the hazards, some were, you know, which one were lifetime violations, which one were deadlocks. And then the ones that's unclassified are generally just brand new, okay, that came out of our analysis. So I think with that, is that my last one? Um, Andres is gonna come up and drive, and Ilya is gonna come on and start and talk about the first categories, deadlock, deadlock rules. Ilya, you just tell me when you're ready. I'm ready, you can go to the next slide. And here is an overview of what we have uh, about deadlocks in the current uh, core guidelines rules set. First, you can uh, you are advised to use RAI and not the plain lock and locks. The second, uh, you are advised to use uh, lo specific algorithms to acquire multiple uh, mutexes at once at one time. Then uh, you are advised to uh, not doing something unknown uh, while uh, holding a lock, you know, because this unknown can do some uh, other magic with locks and you are getting to the deadlock. The next one is regarding the data you are uh, dealing with, and it is advised to keep the data closer to the mutexes, uh, which should guard them, because you can forget to or lock or unlock those mutexes and you end up with the same situation of deadlock somewhere else. And the last one is the regarding the coroutines uh, and using the mutexes uh, at the point where you get a suspension point. You have no guarantee to arrive at the same thread uh, after that. Thus, uh, everything is very uh, thin eyes to get the dead deadlocks. Uh, this is a solid start, but there are plenty of other cases where it can get a deadlock. So we try to look at that in more details. And on the next slide, we are we will see uh, looking into the first of those rules and comparing of what we uh, thought of uh, on our side regarding the Misrael rule. With the MISRA rule, uh, we named specifically all uh, mutex objects and uh, asked to not uh, call member functions of those. And we see that it is a little bit different from what we see in core guidelines. And uh, with that, uh, we propose to modify it a little bit to include all the other things because uh, mutex, some mutexes can be locked not only with lock functions but with other similar looking functions. With that we think that we extended the scope to the role to time the mutexes and encourage try to for the trial lock use cases. At the same time there is a function which is free function which is called std lock which was in the gray area of the rule. From one point of view, you can think that it is forbidding you to use that, uh, but from the other side, nothing in the rule uh, itself and examples uh, reference to this uh, free, free function. And with our modifications, we think we made it a little bit more clear that there are reasonable use cases for std lock functions and we can cover it with other rules. The next slide. Another uh, example of the rule which we think that worth uh, uh, 
tiny modification. It is a rule, a rule about acquiring uh, multiple, multiple mutexes. We have almost exactly the same rule on the MISRA side, but we included uh, trilog uh, pre-function as well in, into the list. Because basically this function has a straightforward way to acquire multiple mutexes. And it is a reasonable way uh, to try that if you are ready to the fail and you can do something else while you're waiting uh, for the next try. Uh, in order to apply the previous rule about try, you can uh, use a scoped log on success of this try log function and uh, keep with the uh, right protected uh, code afterwards. Uh, next slide. And this is another example. The example of the rule which we think is uh, reasonable for Misra, but it is not that good for Kogre lines. The rule is saying that you should not destroy the objects of the mutexes while it is locked or shared locked. And it is absolutely correct thing to do not to destroy those objects, but it is a, not a rule for human. A human will never try to do that on purpose. It is some bug uh, which is uh, there in the code, and if someone uh, sees that bug in the code, he will flag this regardless of existence of the Koga lines rule. With that, we think that it is a not good place uh, for Google guidelines to remind about that. At the same time, on Misra side, we can encourage uh, two uh, developers to develop methodologies for automatic deta detection of such uh, cases because they are really hard to find if uh, someone added them into the code by mistake. Uh, the next slide shows somewhat similar case, which we think that it is a reasonable rule for Misra, but it might not be this uh, that good for Koga lines. And the rule is about uh, the order of the locks and unlocks. So it says that the locks and unlocks shall form a, a directed icyclic graph. It is a, reason, it is a right thing to do, but this rule is too generic to be easily applied by human. When you review someone's code, uh, you rarely try to build the graph in your mind and try to uh, understand whether those mutexes and locks and unlocks form this graph. So it doesn't help uh, a human much when they do their review. And with that, it is not that good in core grade lines, at least in the current form. Maybe it can be reformulated to the way uh, where it is more useful or where you are doing your review, but uh, it shouldn't talk about graphs in this case. At the same time, as a Misra rule, it is again inspired tool developers to check uh, such properties, at least uh, on some visible subgraphs. We acknowledge that it is almost impossible to build a full graph of, uh, of uh, uh, mutexes and locks and their locks and unlocks on the scope of the whole application, but some cases of such behavior can be detected by the tools and it will be already a big help for the developers who try to do the safe programming on their site. With that, I think I'm talk talking about deadlocks and give the time to see about lifetime violation. 
Thanks, Ilya. Um, then, uh, I will tell you a little bit uh, about the, the lifetime violation rules. Um, so the, the, the fundamental rules, uh, rule about lifetime that you will find in our document uh, is this one, which simply says, a threat shall not access objects who, whose lifetime has expired. Um, so if, if you have worked with MISRA before, you probably know these, these kinds of rules. Like it's, it's sort of very generic rules that like catch some, somewhat obvious things, right? I mean, it's, it's clear that you should not do this because it's undefined behavior. On the other side, like the rule doesn't really tell you how to avoid this, right? Um, and in particular, if, if you look at like what, what a tool would have to do um, to, to diagnose this, then you will find out that it's pretty much impossible to do reliably in a language as flexible as, as C++. Um, so the dead giveaway here is the um, categorization that we uh, assign to the rules in, uh, in MISRA. Um, so we, we usually distinguish between uh, rules that can be diagnosed locally and those that require system analysis. Um, and of course, you would prefer rules that are uh, diagnosable locally. Um, and the core guidelines are actually pretty insistent on uh, like restricting themselves to guidelines that can be checked locally, simply because as soon as you have to go to the system level, analysis becomes a lot more expensive um, and like what the, what the core guidelines really want you to be able to do is run the, the, the checker basically as part of every compilation cycle, right? So the cost should be on, on the same order as, as what, a, what a compilation costs. And with system-wide rules, it's, it's a lot harder, right? You need to build like a global database of everything that's going on in your project. It's very hard to do and very expensive. Um, the uh, other thing here is uh, whether the rule is decidable or undecidable. Um, so ideally, we would like to have tools where you can give a clear algorithm that is able to detect violations reliably. Um, but in some cases, that is just not possible, either because there's like certain corner cases that, that you just will, will slip through your hands, or like in this case, because the, um, like the problem is just fundamentally hard. Um, so in the worst case, you then end up with rules that are both undecidable and require like global system level analysis as is the case here. And nobody likes these rules. We also don't like these rules, um, but they, they still serve a purpose here. Um, so in, in MISRA, there is, um, we, we have like these, these, these layered approaches, right? That we, um, we, we often have very specific rules, which we then enforce very rigorously. We, we give them like a, a high criticality, like make them mandatory or required. Um, and then uh, we uh, like, we, um, we might have like uh, then fallback rules with, which have a, a different criticality level. Um, so here the, the idea would be that um, like this would be sort of the, the, the catch-all rule, right? So everything that is, that is not being caught by the more concrete rules, this is the one that is supposed to catch it. Um, the downside to this is that, um, and this, this is actually like something that people expect of MISRA, right? Like if, if, if you work in, in safety critical, then you need to tick like certain boxes that you take care of. So like you need some rule that, that you can that you can trace to that um, is taking care of these things. Um, the, the flip side of this is if, if you look at what the, what the tools will actually give you for this rule, um, then it's often very highly dependent on quality of implementation. So if you use two different checkers, they might give you like very different diagnostics uh, for a specific problem. Like one rule might be able to find it, another might not be able to find it. Um, and we try to give examples uh, in, in the rules, like for, for what we consider like the, the, the essential easy cases that every tool should be able to catch. Um, but yeah, your, your mileage may vary. Um, and in particular, these rules are also prone to producing false positives with a lot of tools, which is very unfortunate. Um, so we don't like them, but since we're MISRA and we have other requirements, we still include them. Um, but for the core guidelines, these are really not rules that they want because they want something that like, gives you immediate practical benefit. Um, and those rules are just not great for that. Um, so let's see how the, the core guidelines actually try to address the specific problem of the, um, of, of the, the lifetime management. So in the, in the core guidelines, we basically have three rules here. Um, the first one is like think of a joining thread as a scope container. Second is think of a thread as a global container. And the third is don't detach a thread. And if you just read the headlines, like lifetime violations is 
Probably not the first thing that you think of, in particular for the, for the last one. Um, so the, the mental model that uh, the core guidelines follow here is they want to promote uh, scope-based reasoning about, uh, about lifetimes. And now we will look into like, some more details what they mean here. Um, so if, if we take it like the, the most basic example here, like what we worry about is we, we have a threat uh, and it's, it's accessing some object that was captured by reference, right? So the lifetime of the object is managed externally, not by the, not by the threat itself. So like this, this is really the crucial part, right? This, this object, it's, uh, it's captured by reference. So if it goes out of scope while the thread is still running, then we have a potential problem because now if the thread starts to access it, we have, uh, we have undefined behavior. Um, and I would like, the, the obvious question here is like, is, 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 this, is this example safe? Or like, yeah, that, that's basically the question that you always need to answer. And in this particular case, um, it's quite clearly safe and it, it would even for, for a tool probably not be too difficult to argue this um, because the lifetime of the threat here is clearly bounded by the, by the scope. So this is basically analogous to, uh, to a function call, right? Like when, when you pass a, um, a reference to an object to a function call and the, the, the function does not save the, the reference anywhere in, in some external place, then you, you, can, you, can, uh, you can just look at the scope of the object and see, yeah, like the, the object stays in scope for the entirety of the function call and therefore it's safe. Um, and in, in this case here, yeah, that's true as well because we have a joining threat, right? So like before we access this, this function f, um, the, uh, the, the jthread con constructor will actually do a join. So it will wait for the thread to complete. Um, and only after the thread has been joined, it will destroy the object. So th th therefore it's safe. Um, and this is really like the model that we would like to be able to think about this stuff all the time, because that, that, that is something that is very easy to reason about, like for both tools um, and for, uh, for humans. Um, so the, the, the thing that the, the core guidelines here want a tool to do in, in terms of enforcement is like they mainly want you to not detach the threat, right? Because as soon as you have joining threads and you don't detach it, then you, you always know the, the, the scope of the threat and then you can, you can do this, uh, this kind of reasoning. Similarly, um, for a... Uh, um, for a, a classical STD thread, so not a, a joining thread, but like with an STD thread, uh, it's um, like it, it doesn't join automatically in the destructor, right? So you either have to join it explicitly um, or you have to detach it. Um, so what the, the, the mental model of the core guidelines here is that like they think of a, um, of a thread uh, as a, a global variable that, that captures it. Because like typically if, if you don't join it, then you have to detach it, and at that point, it becomes a global. Um, so their uh, enforcement here for the threat is that they disallow the capturing of local variables, right? So like if, if you capture something, it needs to be a global because the threat is also a global. That is the mental model. Unless, and this is where the, where the last rule comes into place. If you actually never detach the STD threat, um, then you're basically back in, in the same mental model as you were for the joining thread. So you still have to write the join explicitly. That, that's the difference. Like with the joining thread, it just happens in the destruct automatically. Um, but if a tool can prove that you never detach the thread, then it can apply these um, like scope-based re uh, reasoning rules um, to analyze the lifetime. So, you might still be a bit puzzled, like why they, why they express it in this way, uh, like with the uh, analogy to containers, right? Like that does, this doesn't seem very obvious um, when, when talking about threats. Um, and the reason for that is that um, like these rules don't exist in a vacuum, like the core guidelines is a pretty big document. And like one of the uh, main features of the core guidelines, um, if you go back to uh, the CBPCon keynote in 2015, there were two keynotes, uh, one by Bjarne uh, writing good C++ and then this one by Herb uh, writing good C++14 by default. They introduced this idea of uh, um, like a lifetime profile, um, which is a, a set of uh, rules that 
are locally trackable that allow you to give a formal argument why your program does not have lifetime violations or does not have um, memory leaks, for example. And um, it's, a, it's a pretty powerful idea. Uh, it, it goes into a similar direction into like how uh, like languages like Rust, for example, uh, build their reasoning uh, about, uh, about memory safety. Um, and so uh, if, if you haven't seen the talk, I uh, highly encourage you uh, to, to watch it. It's been a while since, since this was announced and progress has been a, a bit slow, but the idea is still very powerful. Um, and like the, the main progress that has been made since this announcement uh, has been uh, collected in this document, uh, P1179, uh, which is the, the lifetime safety profile. So this one is also linked from the, from the core guidelines and that contains it's a pretty big document and it contains like basically a collection of rules that, uh, would you, that you would need to implement in a checker um, to uh, like have this um, sort of formal reasoning uh, about uh, object lifetimes. Um, and in particular, like one of the things that they, uh, that they address in this document is the, um, the lifetime of objects captured by containers. And that, that is actually where, uh, why, they, why they talk about this analogy, um, like thinking of threads as containers. So the assumption here is, if you're already using the core guidelines, then you already have a checker that is able to understand this, this lifetime model and uh, be able to do this scope-based reasoning for other kinds of resources. And if you now follow these three little rules uh, that they added about threads, then you can use these same rules that were implemented for the other containers to also check the lifetime for the threads. So that's their idea here. So they're, they're building on this existing work uh, from, the, from the lifetime safety profile and then like just restrict the, the threads just enough so that you can check them by the, by the same checkers and you don't, you don't need to write like a completely new lifetime analysis from, from, uh, from scratch. Um, so basically if, if all threads are scoped, then um, they, they really work, work the same as a container, right? Like if, if you imagine you have a vector that takes like pointers to some local objects, exactly the same rules they would need to, to check for lifetime violations there. Um, you can also use uh, for the threads if they are like properly scoped. So the problem that we have in Misra, of course, is that we don't have this lifetime profile uh, at the moment. So it's a, um, it's, it's a pretty big document, like this was too big for us to integrate in, into the guidelines that we have. Um, and we probably also couldn't adapt it like one to one because like the, the, of, of the way that, that Misra works, um, like the rules are, are formulated in a specific ways. Um, tools have a, a specific way of enforcing them so that they would need to be adapted. So we, we cannot just do the, the, the same thing um, that uh, they do. And uh, yeah, we, we need, we need to, to stick with the, with the more general rule here. Um, so the analysis was uh, still not in vain. So uh, like one thing that we found while we uh, compared the, the core guidelines to our rules is that um, the core guidelines currently still only talk about GSL joining threads. They have not been updated to mention the STDJ thread, which was added with C++20. So that's an addition that we had identified that we will uh, propose for uh, upstream to, to be included in the core guidelines. Um, so what are actually rules that, um, that we identified for MISRA that we think would be good to also add in the, in the core guidelines, right? So like that, our, our goal here is really to um, like minimize the, the difference between the two standards, right? So whenever one standard identifies a, a rule that would be good for both, then we, we really want to keep both in sync. So in particular, we, want, we absolutely want both standards to be consistent. You should not end up in a situation where MISRA wants you to do one thing and the core guidelines wants you to do another thing, and you cannot do both at, at the same time without violating one of those. Um, but ideally, we, we would also like to have like as, as much in common in terms of guidelines um, as we can so that you don't have to uh, have to check like two sets of guidelines and, and do twice the work. Um, 
So um, these these are some examples for uh, for for rules that, that that we had and that we think would be good um, to um, to also include back upstream into the core guidelines. Um, so you see, for example, here the um, like when when you use the, the the free lock functions, we want to make sure that um, you eventually uh, put the um, put the ownership of the lock back into an RAI object, so one one of the lock cards. Um, we had a rule that um, we um, don't actually like you to do to use recursive mutex um, because they're they're often a code smell and can be quite hard to reason about. Um, and we actually found out that when we discussed this with uh, with the core guidelines editors, that they actually intended to have the same rule, and it was just an oversight that they did not edit yet. So um, that that was pretty nice. Um, then another rule that we have is. Um, uh, so you probably know condition variable, um, which is used to um, like notify or, or wait for events in, uh, in C++ 11. There's also the somewhat lesser known condition variable any, um, which is like a little bit more uh, generalized in that it allows you um, to use the condition variable with um, arbitrary non-standard mutex types. Um, but of course, if you're using the standard mutex type, then you can just use the normal condition variable. Because like the only point of the condition variable any is if you are using a different mutex. So we are just saying, yeah, like if you have a standard mutex, it really doesn't make much sense to use this more flexible mechanism. So please don't do this. Um, another thing is um, uh, if, if you're using STD async and you don't specify launch policy, um, you get basically implementation defined behavior. So you don't know whether um, the, the, the function that you passed there will be uh, executed sequentially or in parallel. Um, and this is also something that Misra really doesn't like. So um, like we don't want code to rely on implementation defined behavior because if you imagine you have a safety critical project, now you switch from like one hardware generation to the next, it's pretty common that uh, you also have to switch out your entire build tool chain. So if you then go to a new compiler that has like a different implementation defined behavior, then your code might silently break and you might not notice this until it's too late. So um, Misera really wants you to, um, to, to minimize the, the amount of implementation defined behavior that you have in the code. And that, that is why we have code like this. Um, but in this particular case, we were also figuring um, that like, it's also a pretty good rule in, in general um, because it, yeah, it, it, it just makes, yeah, like, it's a pretty substantial difference, um, and uh, we, we figured that it's that it's uh, that is always better to be explicit in this case. Um, exactly, and like we also had a rule that like you shouldn't put the STD mutex on the heap. That we also figured is something pretty weird um, that that you would not want to do. Um, then we had another category where um, we. Uh, found uh, where we had rules in the, in the MISRA guidelines that uh, we would not uh, adapt one-to-one -one, uh, into the core guidelines, but that, that would trigger modifications to, uh, to existing core guidelines. Um, so one thing here is that um, uh, we, of course, want you to not uh, have unnamed uh, lock guards, because if, if it's unnamed, it's just a temporary, which means it will lock and unlock right away, uh, which is almost always wrong. Yeah, pretty much always wrong. I don't think you would ever want to do this on purpose. Um, the core guidelines already had a, a very similar rule for this, um, but they did not include all of the uh, all of the lock guard, uh, all of the lock guard types. So this is again like a, a modernization um, of, an, of an existing rule. Um, then we also had this um, this rule that uh, talks about um, yeah that tries to discourage the, the double check locking pattern, which is um, like something that people used to do a lot uh, back in the pre-C++11 days uh, and very often got it wrong. <laughs> um, so like both us and uh, the, the C++ core guideline don't want you to like hand roll code like this, but rather use the, the standard library to implement these patterns. Um, and here the, the, the main contribution was that we felt that the way that the core guidelines specified this rule made it very unclear how it was supposed to be diagnosed in practice. Um, so uh, we had uh, uh, 
uh, a formulation here that, that we felt were a little bit easier to understand for tool vendors um, and thereby um, would lead to a, a more consistent enforcing of the rule. Um, then an, uh, an interesting point is also the, uh, um, the last one. Um, so uh, uh, I, I, told you, I talked to you already about the rule that we don't want you to use recursive mutex. Um, and we actually found in this rule, CPP, uh, CP22, which is not really about recursive mutexes at all, but it contains an example that is formulated in a way that it suggests the core guidelines encourage you to use recursive mutexes for certain use cases. Um, and since the core guidelines did not have an this, this rule that we have that you should not use recursive mutex at all, uh, we were unsure uh, at first, like whether the core guidelines actually meant to encourage the use of recursive mutex. And it turned out that no, 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 that was absolutely not what they wanted. Um, so we, are, we have now proposed to change this example to make it more clear that uh, it's not an encouragement in this case. Um, then we also had a, a couple of rules which um, like our uh, exclusive to Misra, like Ilya already uh, talked about some of those. Um, so like th this is really mostly uh, rules um, like the one where um, uh, that, that would either be hard to, to diagnose for humans um, or that would be about errors that um, like really um, where human basically would never write this code, um, but it still would make sense uh, for a tool to have an automated check for that. Um, and uh, yeah, like in, in the case of the, um, of, of the um, like with the, with the order of the nested locks, um, that, that is again a rule that is like, uh, in, in terms of the complexity that, that is required to check it, um, it's not really a good match for what the core guidelines want, want the checkers to be in terms of local reasoning, but like Misra checkers, like they, they spend a lot more computation time on this kind of stuff. So for them, it's okay. Um, with that, I would hand over back to Michael um, to yeah, talk a little bit about like potential future rules for uh, the newer language features. Thank you, Andreas. that was great. <laughs> all right, all right. So ready to look at where we are in the world? <laughs> well, you saw the slide about an hour ago when we were doing concurrency, where I basically, I've, I've been involving concurrency pretty much since the beginning um, in 2000. And I've tracked here in this slide all the things that we've added for every release of C++. Um, and in, in red, what we added for C++ 20. As you notice, um, just in summary, C++ 20 added a lot uh, for asynchronous. So I like to think of concurrency parallelism separated into three or four kinds. Um, asynchronous agents, things that you can send away without locking up your computer, right? And you know the print job keeps going and your screen doesn't freeze. Concurrent collections, if you have multiple, you want to operate multiple objects all at the same time, things like that. That's very common, vector SIMD. Um, and, but one of the things that, that is very, cha very challenging when you're incorporating uh, legacy language with global variables is you want to be able to figure out how to control mutable shared states. And that usually involves also low latency. And recently I've added a new column on heterogeneous and distributed acceleration because I like to think which one of these uh, features can benefit from, um, from, for, uh, for accelerators and distributed computing. So just to summarize, um, I'm not going to go over the C++11 or 14 or 17 ones, um, but in the, the ones in red, C++20 um, provided, of course, the big thing that they provided was, um, was um, the, um, the J threads, okay? Which, in case you don't really fully understand it, I, I know you do, but it, what it really does is it gives you cooperative cancellation, okay? Cancellation can be many different levels. And for the most part, P thread is basically, is, is basically kill, kill, and kill, okay? <laughs> you know, you, you, I'm sure you, you are familiar with the kill minus nine. Well, that's what P thread is basically the, the, there, right? Um, there's no forgiveness, <laughs> you're gonna be dead, and I'm, go and I'm gonna make that happen. So what C20 does is it gives you this cooperative cancellation. It's purely cooperative, but um, if the target doesn't check, then nothing happens, okay? Now there are all these other uh, interrupt tokens that's also been added. I'm not gonna go through them all, but hey, uh, you can go through them at your leisure. It all had to do with, you know, getting a stop source token, um, you know, passing the stop token to a new thread or task, and then you want the operation 
to call stop source. You have to do a request stop. And then periodically, you have to call stop requested to check and things like that. That's where the cooperation comes in, OK? Um, Coroutine, other people have all talked about it. It's not technically really um, C, uh, you, you know, uh, concurrency, but it does give you, um, it's all about, is coroutine is a function that can be suspended mid-execution and resumed at a, late, at a later time. And resuming a coroutine continues from the sus suspension point. Local variables have their values from the original call. Now C++20 provides a, um, a stackless coroutine um, where only the locals for the current functions are saved and everything is localized. This minimize, um, uh, this gives you min minimal memory allocation, which so therefore you can have millions of them in flight. The um, core routines, we call these goal, goal, goal routines <laughs> after goal's, uh, goal Nishino's disappearing uh, core routines. Um, other things that we've added, um, um, under concurrent collection, you'll see things that are much more obscure, like the VEC execution policy and the algorithms unsequence policy, as well as span. I put span in that because, in a way, the capability span enables the ability to work with concurrent collections. And then across to the right, you see we've added a lot for mutable uh, shared states and low latency. And in that space, we have things like um, um, atomic ref barriers, Okay, so what are latches and barriers? Latches is just a single user, single use counter that allows threads um, to wait for the count to reach zero. Using a latch is really great for multi-threaded tests, tests okay? Um, barriers is a, just a reusable barrier uh, where the synchronization is done in phases. Now, barriers is great for loop synchronization between uh, parallel tasks. There's a completion function which allows you to do something between loops, like pass the result onto another step, you know, writing to a file. We also have things like semaphore, which represents a number of available slots. If you acquire a slot on the semaphore, then the count is decreased until you, you release the slot. Um, these days, um, stood atomic of T now provides a, ver a var dot wait function, a member function to wait for it to change. And a var dot notify one and notify all uh, that wakes one or wake all, wake all the threads um, that are blocked in wait. It's like a low-level condition variable. Um, C++20 has finally added uh, something from concurrency TS1, which was um, stood atomic, angle brackets, shared putter, angle bracket T, angle bracket, angle bracket, in addition to the weak pointer variant of that atomic um, um, pointer specializations. Um, I'll go over some of these uh, in terms of the safety concerns on these a little later. But stood atomic ref allows you to essentially perform atomic operations on non-atomic objects. And this can be important when sharing headers with C code, for instance, or when a struct needs, a mat, needs to match a specific binary layout so you, so you can't use std atomic, right? All right, so, that's, so that, that just gives you an overview. But what is safe to use? Okay, so out of these, um, std atomic shared Twitter and the weak pointer variant, well, the thing is that they may or may not be lock free. And if they're lock free, they're likely not gonna be um, and uh, not going to be end-to-end -end lock free, which is important in algorithms that I've talked about with my colleagues on the concurrency TS2, like um, hazard pointers and uh, recopy update. Those are end-to-end -end lock free, including the cleanup is also lock free. You see, most, uh, most lock free algorithms are only lock free until the cleanup stage, okay? Um, which is tricky. If they're not lock free, they're actually a better replacement for share or T and a mutex, okay? Now, these things can be slow under high contentions. So, whereas the concurrency TS has stuff that, that, are, that, do, that are great under, you know, that are great. So, atomic ref, there's some guidance there. Like I said, these are things that are gonna be ongoing work because to find out true safety, it takes time and exposure, okay? These are just early things we know, and I'm sure there'll be more things as we go on. So, with atomic ref, you gotta make sure that all your access, all your, um, has, uh, to that object has to use, go through the atomic ref. Okay, with semaphores, if you're trying to acquire a slot when the count is zero, it's gonna either block or fail. And then with J threads, it's gonna be surprising if you're used to P threads because uh, P threads is, behaves like the existing thread, okay, with, with no RAII capabilities, whereas P J threads could be surprising. Now in today's world, where RAII dominates, it's not supposed to be surprising anymore. I was in the original design with that. The reason we designed stood thread the way we did it was because back then it was a primarily, primarily a p-thread dominated world 
And we felt that if we don't copy exactly the behavior of pthread, that would be that actually would be surprising. Okay, make sense? Um, but after 10 years, we think people have moved on. <laughs> so it is a cooperative, cooperative cancellation, like I said, and if you, the target, don't check, nothing happens. Okay, now coroutines, we already have um, core guidelines on these. Don't use capture, capturing lambdas that are coroutines. Um, okay, so what's that about? Well, well, it turns out that usage patterns that are correct with normal lambdas are hazardous with coroutine lambdas. The obvious pattern of capturing lambdas, lamb capturing variables, is going to cause um, is going to result in accessing freed memory after the first suspension point, even for you know ref counted smart pointers and copyable types. So a lambda results you know in a closure object, right? With storage often on the stack, uh, that's going to go out of scope at some point. So when the closure object goes out of scope, the captures will also go out of scope. So normal lambdas will have finished executing by this time, so it's not a lamb, it's not a problem. But coroutine lambdas may result from the suspension after the closure object is destructed, and at that point, all the captures will be used after free memory access. So the way you control that is flag a lambda that is a coroutine and has a non-empty capture list. Okay. Next thing. Okay. Don't hold locks or other synchronous primitives across suspension points. Okay. So why? Uh, sorry. Let's go back. Okay, so why? Okay, so this pattern basically creates a significant risk of deadlocks. Some types of weights are going to be, is going to allow the current thread to perform additional work until the asynchronous operation has been completed. So if the thread holding the lock performs work that requires the same lock, then it will deadlock because it is trying to acquire lock that is already locked, uh, that's already holding, right? So if the coroutine completes on a different thread from the thread that acquired the lock, then that is going to be U UB, undefined behavior. Even with an explicit return to the original thread, with the, sorry, let me get my mind straight here. Even with an explicit return to the original thread, an exception might be thrown um, before the coroutine resumes. And that, then the result is going to be that the lock guard is not destroyed, it's not destroyed. Now this pattern is also bad for performance. Uh, when a suspension point is reached, like a core await, the execution of the current function stops and other code will begin to run. And it might be a long period of time between before the core routine actually resumes. So, so for that entire duration, the lock's gonna be held. And you cannot acquire by other threads to perform the work. The enforcement here is simple. You flag all lock guards that are not destroyed before coroutine suspends. Make sense? Okay. Last one, the CP53. The parameters of coroutine should not be passed by reference. Now, so here's, here's the way you, this, this works. Once a coroutine reaches the first suspension point, like a core weight, for instance, the synchronous portion returns, right? After that point, any parameters passed by reference are going to be dangling. Any usage beyond that is going to be UB, which might include writing to free memory. So the problem doesn't apply, doesn't apply to reference parameters that are only accessed before the first suspension point. Subsequent, any, any following changes uh, to the function might add or remove, oh, sorry, might add or move suspension points, which would reintroduce, reintroduce this, this bug again. So sometimes the coroutines have the suspension point before the first time, uh, for, before the first line of code in the coroutine executes, in which case reference parameters are always unsafe. So it is safer to just pass by value because the copy parameter is gonna live, um, is gonna live in the coroutine frame that is safe to access uh, throughout the core routine. Can I, I'm just gonna defer questions there. I just make sure I wanna get through my slides, thanks. Uh, so the same danger applies to output parameters, of course. Um, so basically core routines, so basically you should just avoid them entirely. And you, what you should do is flag all reference parameters to a core routine. Okay. I know you talked about this, Mark, in some of your talks, so this probably is related in some ways too, right? Okay, so what about TS2? So I am the TS2 editor and what is coming has hazard pointers and RCU. 
Um, and as I said before, some of that is going to target to IS-26. Okay, here's the thing. The beauty with deferred reclamation in TS2 is that it can be applied readily to most concurrently linked data structures. And it's not hard to um, convert rough counts to reference counting to hazard pointers. There's no blocking concerns because as reclamation objects are bounded and hazard pointers are basic that now is being um, amenable to what's called synchronous cleanup in future. So you cannot, you should not have any dependencies on destructors. With RCU, the, re the reader might block reclamation um, if unbounded, so an unbounded amount of memory might remain unclaimed. So, but in safety critical, memory is bounded anyway by this weird formula, okay? So in safety, if you use static allocation, then you will not have new injections, you know, a new cat being injected, you know, in that example I created with shorting, shorting a cat, okay? And this is actually good because it's not gonna block any recl reclamation, any cleanup will not be blocked. Beautiful. If you recycle a fixed number of statically allocated blocks in an RCU header, reader, then it's less damaging um, to update than blocking um, in, an, in a read write, read or writer locking reader. So an RCU reader typically only blocks recycling of memory and it allows updates to proceed concurrently uh, with RCU readers. Whereas in contrast, a read or writer lock uh, reader blocks updates completely. Coroutines, just like that uh, CP23 or 20, I don't know which one, um, for mutex, RCU readers should not span a coroutine suspension point unless you use, there are special um, um, non-extended extensions from Boost that allows you to escape it, okay? Uh, I haven't fully studied it, but it seems it might work. Uh, but with reference counting, but, but with hazard pointers, it turns out just like reference counting, they don't, it doesn't matter that you, and you can hold them across coroutine suspension points. And even furthermore, you can pass them from one thread to another. So, and the last thing is that both hazard pointers and RCUs can have debugging issues because of the thread switching, okay? Um, okay, to, now let's, go, go, let's circle back to what's the difference in C++ called guideline Mizra. Okay, it's a very common question. We ourselves are confused for many years. I think after about six years of work, we kind of got some clarity. <laughs> so this is what I'm gonna say, what we think now, okay? So they're, they're the two best guidelines, bar none. Both are actively updated. They're not perfect, nobody's perfect, but they're both actively updated, that's important. The code guideline is a coding guideline. It's the safety is a byproduct of that elegance that they, get, that they import. So it's good for human evaluation and some machine evaluation. Um, they state rules generally in the positive, not exclusively, like do this. So it's easy for a human to do. Right. Um, they aim for more elegance, which can be safe, but not necessarily safe. They're updated as new C++ comes out and they don't maintain older C++ version. That can be a problem in the embedded world and safe where they tend to be two, three ratifications behind. Okay. Um, they rely on local static analysis as Andreas says. Now Microsoft has implemented a lot of it in GSL and they are needed to, 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 to follow good design. There's lots of sequential rules and about, like I said, about 36 parallel rules, which we're hoping to inject in the future. It's mostly a top-down look at programming. Now, Misra, where do they sit? They are safety gui guideline, not about elegance. They trap accidental coding mistakes, mistakes that can kill you. Um, they state rules in the opposite, in negative. Don't do this, which makes it difficult to figure out, well, what should I do when I'm programming? Um, they aim for machine automated checkable because there are large number of rules you can't, you can't have it all in your head. So best for a machine to just apply it automatically to your code, okay? And then flag them all. And then you just figure out what to do. The update is slower than core guideline because safety compiler support is usually at least one and often two, three levels behind. Um, there's lots of them out there, Coverity, Sonosource, Clockwork, Helix, Axivion, and a few other ones I probably have forgotten. They're kind of mechanical, which makes, allows them to make money for these tool makers, they're bottom up. And in 2022, all this, all, it's up to 22, it's been all sequential. With ours, it's the only parallel that will enter, we think, after Misra next. Okay, our conclusion, what you need for safety? You need both. Misra C++ have good sense of what can be automatically checked now. And using Misra certified tools supports the uh, safety API. And you can work with safety certified compilers for the ABI part. Safety certified compilers, however, takes a long time to come out because they have to verify. Every binary has not changed in some ways. 
So you can see that, you know, even the last one, that the, the most recent one you can get is probably 17. Um, C++ code guideline, you need it too, because this is, you're gonna use that to see what is coming, what makes code elegant and by extension safe. Um, they, that way you can reduce the amount of change you need to do in the future. There's overlapping coverage between for both, um, so that we want to make sure that they don't disagree. Um, and of course, C beyond his keynote, and not just this year, pretty much every keynote he's given has been mostly been about resource management and safety um, in some taxed way. So with that, thank you. I'm gonna invite my colleague back up here. And I, don't, I know we don't have a huge amount of time for questions. And we actually have no time for questions. So we're gonna um, intercept you guys um, after the, the session for about the next 15 minutes. And then uh, we'll see you guys um, probably next year because we intend to keep this going. Thank you. Thank you.